Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bezerra Spiritual Healing, this date of August 20, October 22nd, 2023. And this is uh, an opportunity for both education and the application of the education through spiritism. And we begin every meeting with a prayer, and I will be leading that prayer today. Please close your eyes. And with your feet on the ground, connecting with Mother Earth, slow deep breaths. God, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to continue our journey and to progress forward with knowledge and charity and love, applying that knowledge. We thank the spirits who mentor this group and each of us individually, those spirits who have prepared us for this moment to listen effectively. We humbly request permission to begin today's session, and so be it. There it is. Thank you, Mark. Bezerra Spiritual Healing Center is a nonprofit organization in California supporting all beliefs and all faiths, welcoming all attendees to our offerings throughout the week. Sundays, we offer this service, 10 a.m. Pacific time. It runs as hour and a half, two hours typically, and it is comprised of two different sections, education and spiritual healing. On Sunday nights, in conjunction with Divine Light, we have a book study, and we are finishing the book, not yet finished, but um, getting close to the end of the book, Sex and Destiny. Every night at 6 p.m., we have a prayer service. Each member of BSH has volunteered to lead that short prayer service where we pray for our earth, its inhabitants, and specific needs as we are so moved. And again, all are welcome. If you have specific names and situations that you would like focused healing efforts, we meet on Monday nights with a closed group of mediums. And we work collectively with the spirits to address many different types of spiritual and physical healing needs. On Tuesday nights, we have another book study in conjunction with Divine Light. And that begins at 6.30, right after prayer. On Wednesday night is our personal transformation study led by Tanya. And we have a variety of different readings and introspective elements relative to our own individual progresses. Wow. On Thursday nights, we meet and, and discuss a book called Living Spring. And each week we have a chapter of discussion, personal reflection for the benefit of all. And in each of these evening services, the times are Pacific times for those of you who are not located on the West Coast. In each of these services, we individualize and we collectively apply our knowledge. It's a wonderful process to be part of, whether you are beginning your journey in spiritism or have been effectively participating for a long period of time. It's stunning how each week, each month, each year, we continue to progress. Friday nights are our free nights. 
to do as we wish, as are Saturday nights. But there are a variety of different spiritist opportunities online from other spiritist centers and organizations like the U.S. Spiritist Federation. And by the way, just a personal plug, they have a Saturday morning event. It's, it's also shown on Friday nights, but they have a Saturday morning event. And whenever possible, I try to attend it. It's always excellent. We get excellent speakers from all over the world. And uh, the one we just had by is a gentleman who's spoken for BSH before. And if you have a chance to go back and watch last Saturday morning's presentation by Luis Lima, it's really, really good. Mm -hmm. Really good. Okay. Um, we now move to our prepared portion of today's meeting. And today our speaker is Teresa Castro. Teresa lives in Connecticut. Vermont. Oh, I'm sorry, Vermont. <laughs> I knew it was up there. And, uh, and uh, she has been a wonderful active member, uh, not only with BSH, but throughout um, a variety of different entities in the world of spiritism. And Teresa, I didn't even see what your title was today, but I'm sure it's going to be poignant for all of us. So I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Mark. One last thing, everyone, please mute your microphones. Oh, yes. Thank you. Okay. So, yes. Um, do not separate what God has joined. And just to let you all know why I'm sharing on this chapter, this was assigned to me a year ago, and I wasn't able to do it at that time. I don't know what happened, but we had to reschedule it. And um, so here we are a year later, I'd like to share on this chapter. Um, <clears throat> so interesting things about this chapter is um, it is the shortest chapter in the gospel according to spiritism where chapter five is the longest, blessed are the afflicted, chapter 22 is the shortest. Also, this begins the part of the gospel that there are no longer any uh, spiritist teachings in the chapters until you get to chapter 27, which is ask and you shall receive. So this chapter, it's the shortest and it has no spirit teachings. Usually in the back of each chapter, there's a couple pages on messages received from spirits on whatever topic the chapter's on. This one does not have one. So um, I think let's, it'll be interesting to better understand what was it that Kardec felt was so important to bring us this chapter. And he starts out with a verse, um, a story out of the New Testament, like he does with many of the chapters, he'll start with um, either a parable or some teaching by Jesus. So um, I, I need to ask people to read because I need this to be interactive. I can't be talking the whole time. So um, I know, Nora, you're there. Would you mind to read this um, passage? Sure, sister. <clears throat> well, item number three. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife his certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immortality and marries another woman, commits adultery. Matthew 19, verses 3 to 9. All right. Thank you, Nora. So 
let's break this down. And so we can understand its connection with the chapter. I mean, it's obvious this is the the verse or the story where Jesus says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Um, but as always, Jesus is teaching us something. Jesus is exemplifying. He is telling us how to do something. So what's this about, this test? So what we come to understand is that there were two schools of uh, Jewish oral tradition. So the written law was the Mosaic law. And then there were these two rabbis, Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel. And they were um, rabbis that interpreted the written law. So this is the oral law, which we've probably read about the oral law, the written law. So this Rabbi Shammai, he was, um, he had, he was an interpreter even before Jesus was born. And he was a very, um, you know, strict, so to speak, by the, by the book. So he was strict. They, you know, he took it very literal, um, what the Mosaic law said about, you know, making sacrifices, pure, you know, purifying, eating food, making offerings, very literal. And he, he was also very uh, Israel centric. So exclusive, the very exclusive, the Jewish were the chosen people. Now, and his interpretation, and and we read this, that Moses approved for them to have divorce. They had to give their wife a note, and it was based on indecency or adultery. Okay, so this Shammai supported that. However, his contemporary, this Hillel guy, he was less concerned for temple worship. He was definitely more liberal, and, and the people that followed him we're more tolerant of the Gentiles, although we know the um, Jewish, you know, knew they were the chosen people of God and felt the other people were unclean. And this guy says, okay, listen, you can just divorce. You don't have to even have a reason. You don't have to give a note. So what the, the, these two groups, they were testing to see which side is Jesus on? Is he for the Shemites or the Hillites? <laughs> And so we can see that by Jesus's answer, he's tending toward this, the Shemites. And, um, but Jesus is a great educator because what does he do? He doesn't say to them, look, you guys, you know, we got the law of love, love, the law of love now. So get on board or, you know, forgiveness or he, he doesn't do that at all. He doesn't give them any type of like um, new information. No, what instead he does is he directs them to their doctrine and says, what does it say? You know, what, what, what do you know? And, and, um, but I think the important thing for us to see with these two groups is when I was researching this, they kind of compared them to political parties, just like the Democrat and the Republican. And they said, you know, whatever one supported, the other one was in direct opposition. So, you know, it's very interesting how, if Jesus, you know, were incarnated at this time, is this something we would be testing him? Like, which side is he on? <laughs> um, so I think that's a big important lesson what jesus exemplifies right now in this um story because he's he's pretty much meeting people where they're at he's he's not saying you need to do this or you need to do that but he's saying okay what's your understanding what's your values what is your doctrine and so he the doctrine that we're referring to is the Mosaic law. And we know that the Mosaic law is the first five books of the old Testament. So it is, um, 
it's uh, Deuteronomy, which this one will talk about, um, you know, uh, marital um, directions for marriage and divorce. There was Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, and Numbers. So those are the five books of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy being one of them. And this is where Jesus directs them back to. So what does it say in Deuteronomy? It says that God created man and woman to multiply, to be fruitful, subdue, and fill the earth. And I just picked out some verses. It says way more than what I'm going to share here, but just to relate it back to the topic of um, do not separate what God has joined. The marriage of a man and woman is sacred to God, whether betrothed or consummated. He created man and woman for each other. They were not to share themselves with others, be passed to the next leaders, or taken by force. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it, and it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanliness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of the house. So there you have it. That's what the Shemites were following. And the Helalites had watered it down. And oh, by the way, guess who um, the majority of Jews followed? It was the watered down um, group because, you know, they could, their wife burned their breakfast and they could throw her out, you know, simple as that. And then... Another, it also says is if a man divorced his wife and she remarries, the man may never again remarry her, even if she is divorced again. And I kind of was like, what, <laughs> what's that about? Well, it actually shows how the old Testament, it was humane because this was a way to protect women from being mistreated by their husbands one way, at least. So that was nice. Um, and so Jesus is bringing him back to this information and says, look, this is, this is what it says. Um, but along with that, Jesus gives them, you know, he's not only here, um, he's not here to take away the old Testament, but to fulfill it, to complete it, to enhance it. And so He kind of gives adultery a new definition uh, because he talks about um, in the Old Testament, it was an act of illicit uh, sexual relations. But Jesus starts talking to them about, you know, this is no longer about a piece of paper. What is in your heart? Because in uh, what chapter is it? Chapter eight. It's, um, yes, blessed are the pure of heart in the gospel. There's a section in there that Jesus, uh, where Kardec explained, at one point, the Jews became so focused on outward rituals that they, you know, that's that's how they thought they were relating with God. And that as long as they did these rules, they were, they were good, you know. Um, and Jesus is reminding them that outward appearances do you know do not mean connection with god well it's it's what is in your heart appearances are not enough is basically what he says in that chapter so the other thing that jesus points out is he says whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery now that other group that the hillites they didn't need a reason they could just say I'm done with you. Go on, get out of here. And Jesus reminds them, no, it was based on immorality. And what we find out is the, the Greek word for immorality translates to pornography. So it was really about these lower passions. So also Jesus wanted to abolish the barbaric punishment of stoning because that was the crime, right? If a woman was caught in a drug, adultery, she could be stoned. So do you see how Jesus, so he's so um, awesome. Like he takes this law and so it kind of works against them because then if they 
do this, then they're just as guilty as of adultery and they would be stoned. So we learned this in the Kabbalion about using one law against another. And I think this is a really great example of that. And it falls under the law of rhythm that you can take a law that is in higher vibration, right? Where, you know, being, you know, um, titled adultery instead of being stoned to death. So, and Jesus does just that. He uses one law against another. And so the Jews, though, they're like, hey, wait a minute, you know, we follow Mosaic law and Moses told us we can give a letter and we can give divorce. And, and Jesus says, okay, yeah, right. And why? It was the because the hardness of your heart that Moses permitted you to dis divorce your wives. And so we need to take a look. What is this hardness of heart that Jesus is referring to? So we find out in chapter 11 there, um, which is loving one's neighbor as oneself, item 12. And this is on, based on the Spirit's teachings in from chapter 11. And it's under the topic of selfishness. Pascal helps us un to understand. He says, make an effort to free yourselves of that breastplate covering your hearts so that you may be more sensitive to those who suffer. Hardness kills good sentiments. So this hardness of heart that Jesus was talking about is selfishness. And then again, in the Spirit's book, 785, they tell us this is the greatest obstacle to moral progress, pride and selfishness. So I looked at this and I thought, okay, fine. But wait a minute, Jesus. What about 70 times seven? What about turn the other cheek? Why is immortality, I mean, uh, imm immorality or adultery, why is, it almost sounds like it's not a forgivable item. And I think we can all see right away that these people we're, we're not ready. These rabbis were not ready to hear this message. And if we remember when Jesus talked about turn the other cheek, and if someone wants your, I don't know, your shirt, give them your jacket or, you know, however the verse goes, um, he was talking to those that were in attendance at the Sermon on the Mount. So these were people who wanted to hear what he had to say his followers, so to speak. Sure, there were probably some rabbis there in criticizing, but these were people who were wanting to hear his message. Also, when he says, you must forgive 70 times seven, he's talking to Peter. He's talking to one of his apostles. So we can kind of deduce these rabbis were not ready to, to hear this message of forgiveness, because remember, they're very focused on um, the, you know, the appearances and the rules and washing your hands. Um, and Jesus said, you know, you, you're so concerned with washing your hands, but what about washing your heart? So, but what I, I took this a little bit further and I said, okay, so they weren't ready, but what is it about forgiveness that we need to be ready, that we need to acquire, we needed to acquire because right, all of this is being spoken to us. So I want to take us now, just for a minute, we're going to digress into this book by Alberto Alameda, who we studied a year ago with Divine Light. And in here, um, Alberto Alameda speaks about forgiveness in relationships, in marriage. Okay. So we know a lot of people don't maybe get married today, um, but they're still in this intimate relationship. So we're going to see this as relationships, not like, oh, it doesn't apply to me because I'm not married. No, we all have relationships. So what he says here is that the stability of partnerships, marriage, intimate relationships are challenged by emotional injuries, hurt, and guilt. Now, this is going to vary from person to person because we all have our own perception. So the amount 
or how hurtful or how deep it goes is going to be based on our perceptions. So he kind of breaks it down and he says, okay, offenses. And we're going to really be looking at adultery as the main offense that we're talking about today um, in, in reference to this chapter 22. He says, you can break it down into minor situations, which are very easy to overcome, or major situations, which is going to be more difficult because of these strong um, feelings or attitudes, uh, remorse and resentment, because they can really drip like poison um, into our bodies and cause illness. Um, and also when you get into these major situations that require, um, are more difficult to resolve, there's always going to be a need challenge in order to keep the marriage together. Both are going to need to forgive and both are going to need to be forgiven. And this can become difficult, especially, well, I think it goes both ways, but, you know, we can understand, right? If someone offends you, you know, it's easy to just keep, keep saying, oh, they're the bad guy. They did it. You know, they did it to me. And it's easy to stay stuck there. I think we can also appreciate me flirting with someone's husband and me actually having an ongoing relationship for years on end. There's, there's a different level of offense. I'm not, you know, saying it's okay to flirt with people's husbands, but we can see, you know, there's a different level of offense. There's more involved when there's actual uh, physical, intimate, ongoing relationship versus, versus, you know, a casual flirtation. So he breaks it down even more for us. So please don't get too scared by this because it, it's really quite easy. So when we, we talk about offense, we have minor and misdemeanor. And he tells us that these two categories of offenses, we all do because we're imperfect spirits. And they're based on inappropriateness, immaturity, ignorance. We all do these. When you see this next column of penalty and corrections, look at that as cause and effect, action and reaction. And oftentimes the consequences of things can feel like a penalty, but it actually is a correction. It's there to help us learn and grow. So I think if we really want to look at adultery, we need to look at the more, the two more serious situations. One is serious bodily injury, talking about imprisonment. Now they're not talking about jail, but they're saying most likely with these more serious offenses, the there is going to be a separation in the relationship. And with a heinous, heinous crime, life imprisonment. Again, it doesn't mean they're going to be in jail for life but there definitely is going to be a, a separation. Now, whether it's a divorce or timeout or whatever, that's that that's gonna vary. All right. And so I think we can also, again, as we read this, we can all agree that um, this example that he gives of serious offenses, we can see adultery falling in there, moral abuse, grievous, betrayal, lies, highly disrespectful attitudes, maybe even physical abuse. And he points out that it's the consequences are unpredictable because it depends on how much pain it causes. And when we talk about this penalty correction, the imprisonment, again, it's not that they really go to jail, but most likely there is going to be a separation in the couple's relationship. Um, so it's going to be both partners investing to hold the marriage together. And he talks about the offended partner will need to make room for forgiveness to renew with the offender. Because if we stay in that place, they did this to me, they did this to me, there's no room for repair. The offender is repair their conscience by compensating for their wrong. So it's a taking re responsibility and not just apologizing, but actually doing a correction. So he says it requires great mutual effort on both partners. And he says time. And this is important for us to understand because time may not mean this lifetime. So some of these things we're dealing with today may be from past lives, right? Baggage that we carry. 
And he points out the offended partner is going to need to do hetero forgiveness, which we can understand as self-forgiveness. We're going to need to forgive. And the offender embodies self-forgiveness in regards to repairing the wrong. Again, taking responsibility. But, you know, some of us may still say, well, why the offended person? They were the one that was wronged. But if we cannot forgive ourselves, we're, we're unable to give forgive other people. Just like if we don't love ourselves, we're unable to love other people. Now, I, I really think though, and especially for in this time of Jesus, this adultery was probably a heinous crime. And I mean, you see rape, sex molestation, you know, and they considered women as property. So I'm sure a lot of this was going on and, and probably even murder and homicide, suicide, you know, to get out from under this oppression. I'm sure many women killed their husbands. Anyway, it's a serious, it's heinous crime. And so he says, separation is going to happen in these instances. And he points out that both partners are at risk for future illness. And again, because of those em emotions, right? Uh, every feeling, thought, attitude gives off some type of substance, chemical in our body and has an effect correlating with the vibration of that attitude, thought, feeling. So they're at risk for illness. And this makes sense, right? Both partners are at risk for inability for future relationships. And we know this, right? Somebody gets divorced, they can't deal with blah, blah, blah. They go to the next relationship. What do they find? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, we have to keep working through the lesson. I think the other important part here is that the partners are at risk of obsession. Why? Because resentment and toxic guilt, it's so strong. The vibrations are so low. We open up ourselves to other energies and can fall into um, obsession obsessor spirits. So forgiveness is still on the docket. And again, the offended person to heal the rancor and the offender to forgive the remorse. Because right, if we stay in that place of, oh my God, this is horrible what I did. I can't believe I did this. We're, we're not going to, that too is going to keep us stuck. So both of them need to happen. So I think we can better understand why um, why these fair these Pharisees and rabbis uh, could, could not you know it was not the time for Jesus to start talking for they weren't there they were not there at all they were still on the letter of the law and women are property and very much in the physical physicality. So this idea of coming from the heart, they, they weren't ready to receive that. So anyway, let's get back to the chapter 22 and let's hear what Kardec has to tell us about um, not separating what God has joined. All right, so he starts out the very first sentence, there is nothing immutable except what, what has come from God. Everything that is the work of humans is subject to change. The laws of nature are the same at all times and in all countries. So when Jesus says, do not separate what God has joined, what is he talking about? He's, he's talking about the law of love, that a union through ties of the soul, according to the immutable law of God, law of love, and not the changeable law of humans. So Kardec is first wanting us to make that differentiation is that we know that the, our marriage laws it, it are not coming from God. They're coming from humans because they're constantly changing. And we give some examples. In 2015, the U.S. Um, passed a, um, a law for same-sex marriages legalized in all 50 states. Um, and in the American Samoa, I think that's an island somewhere. I don't know. Um, they, they don't perform same sex marriages, but they will, um, they will honor them. Like, so if you move there and you have, uh, that mar a same sex marriage, 
they will honor your marriage. But if you've been living there, they're not going to allow people, they won't allow the people who live there. Now in 21, 2021, 2022, they, there was passed the Respect for Marriage Act, which recognizes the validity of same-sex and interracial civil marriages in the U.S. and protects religious liberty. So our laws kind of keep changing. So um, Kardec wants us to understand that when Jesus said that, he's not talking about human law. He's talking about divine law, which doesn't change, right? All the characteristics of God, immutable, doesn't change. Okay. Okay. And so what is the law of love? Let's just remind ourselves a little bit here. Um, this is coming from the Spirit's teachings um, from the Gospel According to Spiritism, and it's chapter 8, items 8 through 10. And so the Spirit's tell us that love is a sentiment par excellence, love is the divine essence, love is the reflection of the divinity, love unites all beings, all virtues are the offspring of love, love means being loyal, honest, conscientious to practice the golden rule, practiced by loving all brothers and sisters indiscriminately, indiscriminately, that's important. And here, applying really directly to this chapter is that the law of love the hardness of the heart surrenders to love. So it's like a magnet. Love is like a magnet and our selfishness cannot resist it. So the effects of the law of love is moral betterment of the human race and happiness during earthly life. So again, when Jesus was talking about do not separate what God has joined, it's the marriage per the law of love, which is the union of couples through flesh and soul. So their mutual affection is extended to their children. There are two people to love, care, and enable the children to progress. And this is what Kardec presents to us in this chapter. Okay, so now we're going to look at what is the law that we, you know, we face, our human law. And that is the legal union of a couple as spouses. The, there's three basic elements, the party's legal ability to marry each other, the mutual consent of the parties, and a marriage contract as required by law. And that's important because it's, it's so different in all the different countries. And marriage law refers to the legal requirements that determine the validity validity of a marriage in which vary considerably among countries. So we can see even just in these pictures, the many different types of marriages that are there. So let's look at why people marry. Okay. And I want you to pay attention to these because what I see here is that um, there's a there is a similar thread that runs through why people get married and types of marriages. So companionship and love, this is a reason. It's sharing life's journey, having a partner to rely on for support. And to, uh, you know, to deal with the fear of being alone. So these are just, I must have been some survey or poll that was taken. Um, starting a family. That's another reason people might get married. And because the belief is that if there's a, that to provide a stable foundation for children, that marriage is going to do this. It's going to provide that st stable foundation. And also that, um, that marriage, being married, is going to provide this safer and healthier home environment. All right. And then it talks about emotional security is being having um, a partner who's dedicated in a relationship with you provides safety and trust. And the this having a committed partner is a comfort, right? Then they talk about 
recognition of the relationship. So it's a way of telling, it's a public declaration that we love each other. And also there can be the belief that if we're married, our, our, our relationship is never going to end or it, we're, that's going to hold us together. So then when we look at the types of marriages, I thought I found these quite interesting. Um, so companionship, this is a type of marriage. And this is for friendship, to have someone to socialize with, to do things with. And it's not about romance. So there might not be any. So, you know, maybe if you're frigid, you might want to do that type of marriage. Um, parenting. So it's all about the kids here. And again, romance is not required. And everything is about the children and you're committed to this marriage until the children are independent. Once they're independent, you can renew the marriage or you can get out of it. All right. And then safety. This one is about money, is about benefits. So it's about, okay, I'm going to marry you because you're going to take care of my health insurance while I'm going to school. Um, but they were quick to say that each partner benefits. So it's not just a one-sided thing, but it's based on financial security, health insurance, money, some beneficial um, factor. And then there is um, starter. I kind of like this one. This is a tryout marriage where you do a legal contract. There's, there's agreed that there's not going to be any kids. And so you get to like practice and try it out and see if you want to get married or not. And then after a year, so you, you decide together, okay, we're going to do this for a year or two. Then you renegotiate the contract. So that was interesting. Living alone together. I think this goes on a lot. This is being married, but you have your own homes, your own separate spaces, but you're committed to each other in the relationship. And then open. This is when both partners agree to be non-monogamous. That's, you know, open sexual relations, but it's agreed upon. So it's not anybody sneaking behind anyone's back. And then there's the covenant marriage. And this one, you have to go to premarital counseling in order to get married with this covenant type marriage. And it's hard to end the marriage. So it's kind of this marriage that's going to like make us stay together. Um, even if you do get approved to end the marriage and divorce, it you have to wait two years. And this was interesting. This is legal in Louisiana, Arizona, and Arkansas. So I thought that was interesting. I had never heard of that type of marriage. So I'm just wondering, does anybody recognize a central theme in both the reasons and the types of marriages, if anybody's listening? Selfishness. Oh. Selfishness is riddled throughout these reasons for marriage. It's like what the other person can do for me. And it, it's very much me, my, and mine centered instead of other centered. Or as Kardec is telling us and, and Jesus, it's not coming from the law of love, of being heart focused. Okay. So... Kardec tells us, he says, here's my reasons. This is why people get married. To satisfy pride, vanity, greed, and ambition. And I feel like reading those reasons of why people get married and those types of marriages kind of validated what Kardec said. Um, he says, it's really, most marriages are based on materialism. You and know, Teresa? Yes. It also reminds me of uh, some kind of a business partnership. Yeah. Common thread of all those arrangements. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. Not the law of love. Yeah. So he just, you know, he reminds us in the chapter that outward appearance does not equal happiness. And we know from the gospel uh, in chapter five that happiness we only achieve this 
a relative happiness on earth. And that's by having a clear conscience. So he says, this is the true reason for unhappy marriages, because it's not coming from the law of love, that it's coming from this place of selfishness. And this is why marriages are unhappy. And he also points out in the chapter that it's not the civil, the marriage laws that make that cause unhappy marriages. It's not our laws, it's our prejudices. So the idea of, well, how much money does he make? What's his title? I want to be married to someone who's a CEO. You know, um, you know, is she going to provide me with healthy children? Is she going to be a good housekeeper? You know, it's all these other, our prejudices, you know, does, is she good looking? Yeah that these are what cause unhappy marriages. It's not our marriage laws. It's, and in fact, you know, we might be saying, well, okay, if, if our laws are so imperfect, why don't we just get rid of them? And Kardec is very quick to say, no, no, we, we need these laws. And so let's take, oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, he says the civil law wedding vows, wrote commitments, that we should just remember that these do not replace the law of love. So it's it's good for us to know this, right? Because we can feel like, oh, I got married in the church, though, so it must have been joined by God. Oh, I said these wedding vows in the church, you know, in front of the priest or the rabbi or whoever you get married in front of. And, and Kardec is reminding us that civil law, the, it does not replace the law of love. All right. So he says, uh, you know, human civil law, it's subject to change. It's based on time, place, and intellectual progress. It regulates family interests. So we can't do away with civil law and just say, oh, let's just make it a free for all because our laws are imperfect. Imperfect. No, because we learn in the, um, the spirits book and the law of reproduction and I'm thinking other people should read these. Can you read that, Mark, 696? If marriages were abolished, what would be the effect on human society? Regressing to the level of wild animals and savages. The free and unplanned union of the sexes is natural. Marriage is one of the first results of progress in human societies because it establishes fraternal unity found in every nation and among every ethnic group, though under different conditions. If marriage were abolished, humanity would regress to infancy and would place humans below a few animals that demonstrate having lifelong fidelity to their mates. Thank you. There's another one. If... Is polygamy or monogamy more in compliance with the laws of nature? Polygamy is a human invention, the rejection of which marks an era of social progress. God intended that marriage should be based on the existence of true affection between the individuals who enter into it. In polygamy, there is only sensuality, but no real affection. If polygamy were consistent with the laws of nature, it would be possible to institute it everywhere. However, it would be physically impossible to do so due to the numerical equality of men and women. Therefore, polygamy must be labeled a social custom, adapted to the circumstances of specific nations or populations. It will gradually disappear as these populations improve socially. Okay, and then there's one more. This is by the um, in the Spirit's book under Law of Society. What would be the effect on society if family ties were relaxed? It would lapse into selfishness. Thank you, Mark. So we can see why we cannot just do away with our laws. They're here, they're a validation of our evolution, basically. And as we improve, these laws will change and improve as well. All right, and so another um, 
law we should consider is the law of progress from the Spirit's book. And um, Kathy Rumpler, can you read? Maybe Kathy Rumpler left. Um, Charles, you want to read? Sure. Can society be sufficiently governed only by natural law without human-made laws? Answer. If the laws of nature were prob uh, properly understood and people were willing to practice them, they would be sufficient. But society has its demands and requires a special loss. Okay. So what causes the instability of human laws? During barbaric times, laws were made by the strongest who established them to them on advantage. Therefore, as human beings have acquired a clear understanding of justice, these laws have had to be modified. Human laws will become more stable in the, in the, as they approach true justice, meaning as they represent everyone and are in harmony with natural law. Civilization has created new needs for human beings and these needs are relative to their social standing. People in civilized societies regulate the rights and duties of their standing through human laws. They have often created imaginary rights and duties that are con condemned by the natural law and that every nation removes from it's cold as it progresses because people are influenced by their passions. Natural law is absolute and the same for all. Human laws is variable and progressive. At the inception of human societies, it only could establish the rights of the strongest. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, so it's really, um, I think there might be one more. Yes. Okay. How can human beings be led to reform their lives or their laws? This occurs naturally based on the circumstances and through the influence of more advanced individuals who drive the world forward on the path of progress. It has already changed significantly and will continue to do so. Just wait and see. Yeah, so these this is great, these messages from the Spirit's book. So they're in favor of human law, of, and, and they're, they're giving us a lot of hope, saying, as we progress, and they are progressing, and we're, 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 we're going to raise our vibrations, and we're, we'll have more perfect laws. So we're raise, in vibrations, raise vibrations and understanding. Well, yeah. Because because all these seems to be reflecting of this reality. In these human relations that we have, which is the material uh, realm, is that we are looking in the outside of us for something that we want. So I want to marry this person for that reason, for this reason, and so forth, but outside. Mm -hmm. However, I don't have what I want. I have what I am. So no one has what they are looking for. They have what they are. So that's why in the spiritism, uh, it, it always process, uh, brings us to the process of self-assessment, self-assessment, self-correction, and self-rehabilitation. That's why these laws make sure that we are continuing to progress in that direction of uh, developing a self-assessment, self self-correction, and self-rehabilitation. In a one word, in a mm -hmm. reform. Yes. In a reform. That's yes, yes, need. yes. And this is exactly why Jesus said what he said to them and was so, uh, made such a point that outward appearances are not going to bring us happiness. And the whole chapter, chapter eight, talking about that, about, that the Jews had gotten so focused on 
the external and the rituals and the titles and the, the you know, just what you were saying, Charles, the outside instead of the inside. So, yes, so we can bridge this all together of how this is connected uh, of marriage and so on. Um, I'm wondering, is Tina still with us? Tina, would you like to read this next part? It's a continuation of the law of progress. Okay. Should we be concerned that spiritism may fail to triumph over the negligence of human beings and their attachment to material things? This question demonstrates a very superficial knowledge of human nature. If one could believe that any cause could transform them by mere charm or enchantment. Ideas change gradually depending on the individual and several generations are needed for the complete eradication of old habits. Therefore, the transformation of humankind can be carried out only over the course of time, slowly and step by step. With each new generation, part of the veil evaporates and spiritism will dissolve it entirely. In the meantime, even if it only cures human beings of a single fault, this is a step forward. This would be a tremendous accomplishment because this first step would make the rest much easier. I think this is very clear for us to understand. And I don't know, I was really inspired by it all. Here, here, and I think this is the last one, Tina. Okay. Uh, since spiritism must mark the progress of humankind, could the spirit speed up this progress through general and clear manifestations to convince even the most skeptical, skeptical individuals? You want miracles, but God grants you miracles every day, and yet you still have people who deny their existence. Did Christ convince his contemporaries by the miracles he accomplished? Do you not see people to this day denying the most evident facts despite occurring before their very eyes? Are there not some who say that they would not believe even if they saw it? No, it is not through miracles that God will bring human beings back to their senses. God's goodness allows them to convince themselves through reason. Thank you, Tina. I think that's so beautiful because you know, it's telling us about the inner transformation and, you know, us applying effort and repetition and seeking this, wanting this, applying our will and using our reason and discernment, right? Okay, so so as we can see, um, divorce is a beautiful alternative because, um, you know, the spirits tell us that, you know, imposing is not going to, to work. So to say you cannot divorce or, um, you know, you can do whatever you want. That's kind of to regress, which we can't do that either. So divorce is a human law for legal dissolution of a marriage. It is not contrary to God's love. And Kardec was very specific about that is applicable only in cases in which divine law has not been taken to account necessary when mutual affection no longer the sole objective of a marriage and jesus approves divorce in the case of adultery and kardec says this so this is when we're looking from an earthly perspective i wanted to share with you from the astral or the spiritual perspective and this is there's um a page that is well describes this in the book Sex and Destiny by Andre Luis through Chico Xavier. It's part of the Andre Luis series. And I'm not going to go into the whole story, but so Andre Luis, of course, he's in the um the spiritual realm and he's learning and he's at a community. He's not in No Solar. It's it's uh it's another spiritual community. And in this community, there is um, it's a there are some support institutions for regeneration, 
And so, it, of course, look at the title of the book, Sex and Destiny. So it's dealing with some complications as a result of sex, misuse of sex, misuse of the passions. And one of the judges there, his name is Amantino. He's uh, a judge in the court of Providence. Um, Andre is learning from him. And so Andre asked him about divorce. And what I'm going to play to you is a recording of what he explains about divorce from the spiritual realm, from the spiritual realm, their perspective on divorce. Okay. So let's see if this works. Knowing that all earthly marriages between two people of a respectable level of evolution are based on pre-established plans, either for the benefit of all or as legitimate trials. The higher realms make divorce as hard as possible using all the means available. However, in many cases, it is allowed or even recommended. Otherwise, justice would be reduced to the condition of prepotency against victims of social cruelties that laws on earth cannot repair or foresee for now. After the problem surfaces, the one responsible for the rupture of the union's trust and stability automatically becomes the defendant. By means of resources used by the higher realms, the victim is influenced to be generous and benevolent so that the couple's service plans are not interrupted. This is always important for the community and includes both incarnate and discarnate spirits whose benefits are reciprocal in terms of humility and benevolence for any of its members. For that reason, they arrive at our spiritual homeland as worthy children of God, great women and great men, justifiably considered great before providence if they bear without complaint the infidelity and violence of their partner, forgetting insults and injuries for the love of the tasks the designs of the Lord placed in their hearts and their hands as a result of the moral support given to their family or the continuation of good deeds. Those who display this kind of behavior dignify all the spiritual groups that are connected to, and it does not matter if they come from this or that religion, from this or that world environment. They are welcomed with garlands as true heroes for having embraced without fighting back those who hurt their souls, without withholding their presence and love. However, those who display an obvious inability to forgive offenses, although their lack of inner greatness is pitied, are also helped with their desire to separate. Their debts are postponed until sometime in the future, and the changes required of them are conceded to them. At that point, both partners continue to receive the spiritual help they require according to each one's merits and needs, and both are given freedom and respect as regards changing partners and pathways, along with the natural responsibilities that result from their decisions. This happens, Emantino continued, because divine providence tells us to praise the virtues of those who love unselfishly without forgetting the deference owed to those who live in an, live an upright life but suffer harm in their marriage. The executors of the universal laws acting in God's name do not approve of enslaving anybody and at any spot in the universe the objective is always to uplift free and responsible consciences capable of rising, revered and dignified to supreme wisdom and supreme love, even if it takes choosing multi-millenary millenary experiences of suffering and illusion. Impressed, Andre asked about the morals in countries where men are allowed to have many wives. Judge Amantino explained that polygamy, even if apparently legal, is an animal heritage that will disappear someday, and that if we have reached a level of development inspired by Christ's teachings, 
we mustn't forget that according to the gospel, one man is enough for one woman and vice versa. Okay. So basically, um, their objective in the spiritual world is to up uplift free and responsible consciences capable of uh, rising to love, even if it takes millennia. They're committed to it. And they validate that polygamy is just as the spirit book told us it will disappear as we evolve um, and the importance of one-on-one -on -one relationships. Um, and, and, you know, they're telling us that they try to prevent mar uh, divorce, you know, because our marriages here on earth are based on our reincarnatory plans. And so they're, they're trying to help us to, you know, help ourselves, right. To work for our own inner transformation. They also talk about the importance of trust in maintaining a marriage and they support forgiveness for both the offender and the offended. Um, uh, so, and, you know, they don't approve of enslaving others and freedom of choice is respected and both the offender and the offended receive help from the spiritual realm. So I'm going to stop because I know this was long and I did a lot of talking. So I want to open it up to um, the group if anybody wants to make a comment. Um, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> thank you. And thank you again for letting me share. Amazing how the smallest chapter generates the most reality. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's essential. That's good. <laughs> you know, if, uh, at whatever age you are, you immediately, upon studying this material, you immediately go back through your whole life and all the relationships you've had. Mm. And, you know, yeah, pride, selfishness, materialism, absolutely. And I think a Take lot away. of that is also taught. You know, when you grow up, you know, you want a guy who could take care of you. You want a husband that could provide for you and your children. So I think a lot of that programming is uh, what is enforced as opposed to marry for uh, um, reasons of love and that you guys can teach each other how to grow and move forward, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I think as time, like you said, as time go on, it, the more it gets out there, about these reasons why people marry, I think people will settle in their mind a little bit more and run these questions about around in their mind, you know, why somebody wants to marry me, you know, is it because of what I have? I mean, not me personally, I don't have nothing, but you know, <laughs> it, you know, it's a huge thing to look at, you know, because even when I was young, I used to think about that. Well, you had to be cute too, but still, I didn't want. Um, but I didn't want to get married just to just get married. You know, shucks and heck no, it's work. Anyway, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Thanks, Regina. Yep. Yeah, Regina, appreciate, appreciate. Uh, Teresa, you, it's amazing contribution that you give us with this presentation today because it really helped us stretch our understanding of uh, this whole perspective. Because from my and I, I believe that we're looking into this connection uh, from a very lower perspective, the lower perspective where we are, we are still evolving and you know, we are not at levels where we can see things from above. So it's, uh, it, it, it's a view from below, let me, let me put it this way, which invite us to really think about the title of that chapter, which is do not separate what God has joined. It does not say that God joined men and women marriage. What does God join together that we have not able to understand yet is matter and spirit. Each one benefits from each other because we are promoting evolution on both ends. That's what God's joined us. That's the point of connection. 
And that's what uh, this conversation invites us to think about, to better understanding what is being joined by God. You yeah. know, not too many people hang in there with those relationships once they get married. And there's very few people who I can say in my life that have, that I've witnessed hang in there through the rough parts of the marriage. The where, I mean, where you, you about ready to peel their skin off, you know, because they done done something crazy. But those that do, to me, my eyes are open to see the, um, the levels of growth in, in these relationships, you know. I mean, there's very, very few. And I have a very close friend whose eyes, I, I, I've always appreciated their relationship because I get to see, you know, the ups and downs, you know. And in, my parents were married and divorced three times. I don't know what that tells you, but for me, it was like, what, what, <laughs> what happened? Anyway, all right, I'm done. Yeah, something you said, Charles, reminded me of, um, you know, when they talk about twin souls, um, and, and we remember Livia and uh, Publius Lentulus, and, you know, they're, they're not on the same vibrational level, but they continue to be in support of each other. And then there's also in renunciation, Alcyone and Pollux, or Father Charles, they certainly weren't on the same vibrational level. Uh, level. And she, in fact, was even from another planet. She wasn't even, you know, from Earth. Um, right. But again, you know, she they she continued to support him. And so it's um, it, I don't know. I Those are the two that came to my mind when we think about these twin souls, um, I think, more in, aligned with, you know, God joining, so to speak. Um, but I, I think it probably too it's it, it's where where we put our attention or who we make our t twin soul as well making yeah. the other person important instead well, of but remember uh in the case of alcioni uh she evolved more than him yeah no so she went to a higher realms more evolved where more evolved the spirit lived and uh, she wanted him to progress because she's still waiting for him. Uh, when when we see the twin soul, like we are being made by the same spirit, but we are not the same. The, the, like this one spirit separating two, and we study uh, alternative um, spirituality and we spiritualism, and, and we will see uh, the, the the union uh, or the desire. Uh, the the unification of the higher self uh, with the, the the twin soul is the unification of our higher self with the soul. So that's what I study a lot to understand that the desire, the seek of uh, uh, meet the twin soul. It is our own soul, is our mm -hmm. higher self in our higher realms, and we will see this uh, studying the parable of the 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 prodigal son mm. so when he want to seek to the higher self again he lie he let he separate from the higher self and go to the lower realms and want to live his life so and then it's a desire to reunification but that story is, is good it's still on us so that is why we seek, we seek, we seek the the, the twin soul, you know, we will we, we separate to make people suffering, we suffer, and uh, we are looking for that, that that reunion until the day we will find that is lifting us, is a God lifting us, no? That Christ lifting us, that, that what we seek for twin soul, until we mature enough to understand that. I still... Uh, I, that was very important for me because uh, your presentation, it is a very, very educational and in uh, a therapeutic, therapeutically, as everybody's saying, because it really helps us to understand. I am divorced. Uh, most of us no, are divorced. And uh, so it's a lot of experience. Everyone over here have a story, no? And when we bring to Jesus, remember, I was a Catholic. 
very active in the, in the Catholic uh, movement and teachings and participating. And, and they wanted me to annul my, my marriage because I would not be, not be able to continue my work uh, as a catechist, as a um, member of the, 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 the how they say, it's like of a, a manager of the couples in, in every neighborhood. You have uh, one who are responsible for that neighborhood. So you're responsible for spiritual uh, uh, education, for stu Bible studying and uh, discussion about couples. You have to be studying, prepare about that. In the Catholic Church, they prepare the, the, um, the couples to prepare them for marriage. They study the whole year, all the teachings for for you preparing yourself for, for being married, to what what is to to build a family together, what you're doing together before you make that decision to be married. I think we should uh, uh, we should invest more in that, even for pregnancy, for the both couple to be prepared to bring a child in the world. So everything, it, 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 I don't have much to say there because you brought a lot of information to us today and we have to review this many times if we <laughs> want to get more educated on that. And therapeutically is very important. And the forgiveness uh, and the moral laws and the moral transformation, I believe that is important. I don't believe God's like the term you uh, Charles is coming, but married and forever. Uh, Mar Marie is coming, married, that that kind. I think we planted whatever that we have as we believe in reincarnation. So let's see that I was 19 years old, pregnant with my second child and the, the best part of my marriage. I had a dream I was married with my husband today. Mm. And we were having a happy life. So I wake up very conscious. And I told my doctor, I need to lock my tubes, uh, to cut my tubes or whatever there. Uh, I, I will be married in the future again. I don't want to have a child with this husband and that husband. Ignorant of myself. And, uh, but I believe and I didn't uh, seek for anybody. I just have that and that finish two, three days later. Uh, but uh, 20 years later, I was married. It's the same man I dream that time mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that for me is like everything we do here that my lessons my personal lessons is it is that we come here to live as as a brother charles said um we are um uh, together in the matter and the spirit together but it's in the matter that we have opportunity to to seek pardon and to be pardoned <laughs> And and it should give to one another what we what whatever lessons is not because I hurt Charles in the other life I have to be born and meet Charles again. Mm -hmm. I believe it's the opportunity. Was I I have luck on myself and I I will be married. Uh, my husband both of them have different personalities that I need to learn on myself. Both of them brought a lot with me. When I grow up more and I understood the situation, I, I look back to their defects was the most defect I have on myself to be healed. Thank I you. forgot to look inside myself. I forgot to look inside my defects and I just saw like a blinding things, mm -hmm. uh, like the parable of the one you have in your eyes. You forgot the things you have in your eyes and look in people's selves, no? Right. So I, I put in that on my eyes and I was just looking and uh, seeing their defects, not mine. Right. And they bothered me. They bothered me a lot. So when I learned through my mentor, through spiritism, and uh, when I learned that all these defects, I brought them on myself and I asked God to give me opportunity to heal them. And God, we put in people's consequences in your life to face, for you to face you. 
So their defect bother a lot to you. So is that is in yourself. That is why you be bothered by them. Mm -hmm. So when I learned that today, um, and we don't have a perfect relationship. I have a, my defect, he has his, but uh, I'm more mature in my life. He's too with his experience as a divorce too. And then we try to understand each other correct. What, what the defect that do you see in me? And what the defect I see in you that you, you we can work and we can change that together to make a better relationship. Yeah. Because if it was not for that, I'll be divorced again. <laughs> So we have to learn the lesson, not because I want to come back. Oh, I don't want to come back to finish with that. I tell my 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 kids, I don't want to come back as a wife of your father again, ever. Mm. But I, I want to come back to be his mother. <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> I would be his mother, but never, ever a wife again. That is Tanya, no? So that, that what we are here. Like you said, very well, very well. We are uh, here is God did not determine a law. No, that was not for, for harmony, for love and uh, forgiveness. I love when you said that, how about seven, forgive seven, seven, seven each mistake. Huh? How about that? So I love when Charles said to the, to the God, God unite is the matter and the spirit for us to evaluate ourselves as a spiritual being. My brother, my sister is my, my it, it is resonate from me too. I'm my brother, my sister. Does a matter is a female with a female, a male with a male. That is not, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Right now. Thank you. Thanks yes. so much, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for letting me share. Hey, Teresa, you don't, you don't, go ahead, Dave. You don't, you, you don't leave much wiggle room in what you lay down there. It's nicely done. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, we're going to take a two minute break, grab your water, and thank you again, Teresa. I'm going to stop the recording.